Welcome to the Thriving Farmers Podcast, where our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable and sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to clean their top takeaways in business and life. In this episode, we dive deep with Ben Beichler of Creambrook Farm about herd share, raw herd share milk. And, uh, you know, Ben's been a great friend over the years. We met when I was interning in 2012 at uh, Polyface. And since then, you know, we've founded a business together. I since bought him out as his new farm took off. And so I'll give you a little bit of, of background about Ben. So he and his wife, Kristen, own and operate Creambrook Farm in Middlebrook, Virginia. The farm specializes in direct marketing 100% grass-fed raw milk herd shares that are lab tested. Now that's kind of unique that they actually have a lab on site and do their own testing. That's kind of unusual for herd shares, but they do. Ben is working on developing a completely outdoor system for the Jersey cows where they graze during the summer and enjoy stored grass during the winter. They market to their members primarily through social media and other digital methods. So yeah, Ben's um, a go-getter. There's absolutely 100% confidence in my mind that Ben is going to be someone you will be listening to from national stage in five to 10 years. He's um, absolutely honing his craft. He's an expert at what he does. Um, He and his wife basically started their farm from nothing and uh, have built it up to one of the larger herd shares in Virginia and being very well recognized for the quality of their milk. So in this episode, we kind of dive into a little bit of Ben's background. We talk about the different places he's been, the different places he's worked, and we kind of go into a little bit about how their marketing now is working because they've scaled their herds here very rapidly and uh, done a, a fabulous job of it. So hope you enjoy this episode. I think Ben is a great farmer and uh, super excited to introduce you to him and uh, for you to check him out further. Today on the podcast, we have Ben Beichler, owner of Cream Book Farm. Welcome to the podcast, Ben. Hey, thanks, Michael. Ben, could you give us a little bit of history of your farming background and uh, what brought you to this spot? Yeah, um, so I've been farming full-time now for 11 years. It's been a long journey. So the, the short version is I started Polyface Farms in September of 2007, was an apprentice there. Uh huh. Did the apprenticeship for a year, uh, went on, was a manager with them for roughly a year and a half. Over the next couple of years, worked Kind of independently and also with Polyface sometimes, depending on you know the year and what was going on. And in 2012, uh, struck out. Well, it was actually more like 2011, started Creambrook Farm. Um, 2012, went full-time working for myself. That was also when Kristen and I got married. And that was here locally in the Valley? Yes. Yeah, here locally in the Valley. Uh, we got married out in Richmond. That's where she's from. Uh, came back to Swope, uh, rented a farm, part of a farm, about two miles away from Polyface. Um, we started milking cows. That's uh, when the dairy component of Creambrook started. Before then, we had just done uh, chickens and pigs. Yeah, over the next almost seven years now, it was kind of a whirlwind journey. Okay. Uh, we were there for a little while. We were unsuccessful securing a long-term lease, so that facilitated us having to leave that first farm. Farmed with Kristen's parents for a year, went up to Pennsylvania, ran two organic dairies up there. Uh, one of them was uh, the family cow, which is the yep. largest – raw milk distributor in the east coast as far as i'm aware maybe the numbers have changed last couple years but at that time i believe that was correct and then in 2017 uh, our dream came true and we moved back to middlebrook virginia which is um, you know eight ten minutes from polyface and uh bought our our farm restarted our direct marketing efforts here in the Shenandoah valley and now we're running a raw milk herd share uh that reaches um as far east as Williamsburg. Okay. We physically don't go to Williamsburg as far far east as we deliver is Richmond. And then we have some folks who are willing to meet us in Richmond that, that take it to Williamsburg. But um, yeah, it's 100% grass-fed dairy, all jerseys, no grain, no corn silage. Very um, sustainable, basic, if you want to put it that way. Okay. Our specialty is that we have a uh, actually have a lab here on the farm. So we test all of our own milk okay. before it goes out, which really helps us build customer confidence yep in the safety of the product and also it gives us self-confidence too as far as like hey we, we know this is really good because i see the test results and the great thing about lab is it's unemotional yes it doesn't know you by name just gives you results okay uh, so it's not going to fudge because yes. of you know who you are what you were doing so it gives us a way of kind of verifying ourselves 
Yeah. Even though we're independent, we're not state inspected because there is no state inspection for raw milk in Virginia right now. So yeah, that's that's the very quick overview. Okay. Yeah. Now tell us a little bit about the farm we're on here because it's mm-hmm. um, the history. There's a long history to this farm. Yes. the uh, The farm is uh, 243 acres. It was originally a beef farm. Okay. So when we came here, um, we had some work to do to convert for, to dairy. I mean, the, the good thing is since we're 100% grass, um, our cows stay outside year round. So I don't need a freestyle barn. I don't need a slurry store. I don't need all the fancy dairy equipment. Um, there was a building on the property that had been built to be a butcher shop by the previous owners. After they constructed it, they then decided that they weren't going to use it okay. for butchering. I mean, it's nice to have the combine do that. But anyway, um, it fit perfect for our need for a raw milk. So we were able to convert the cutting room to a milk house. Okay. There was a walk-in cooler on place we could obviously use for milk inventory. And then we put an addition on the backside uh, for actual milking location. And that's where we milk the cows every day. We milk once a day. Okay. Uh, which fits fits our where we're at from a pasture and a feed standpoint and also the fact that all of our cows were CAFO cows before they came here. That's a hard transition on cows going from spoon fed everything to now you're on pasture and having to just make it work. So yes. the once a day milking works for us in that it reduces our labor since since we have so much marketing distribution work to do. And also it takes the nutritional pressure off of the cows because we're in the Shenandoah Valley. This is the fescue area. Beef cows for the most part are final fescue. Dairy cows can struggle with it. You know, it helps that we kind of match the cows' needs along yeah. with their production. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about the, the herd share side of it. You know, How many shares are you doing now? What's your price point? How mm-hmm. do you deliver? That sort of thing. As of right now, this is November of um, 2018. Yep. Had to think there on the year for a second. <laughs> um, we are at 280 shares. Okay. We started doing herd shares a year and a half ago. So okay. it's been a pretty rapid growth. I guess to start with marketing, kind of what we've done with marketing is um, we've tried several different things yep. along the way and kind of found what's worked really well for us is, that's brought on the majority of our growth is if you're trying to find the raw milk drinker, it's a very difficult person to find within the millions of people who live within the state of Virginia. Correct. So social media ads and other traditional venues, it's very difficult to reach that person because they're a small niche and they tend to maybe not use some of the more common communication. You know, everybody's on social media to a degree, but they're very hard to find. Like when you do ad searches and you're trying to like pare it down to what that person is looking for, you're, you'll spend a lot of money and miss them is what we found. Okay. But what we have found is that the raw milk drinker is looking for us. Okay. So we have in turn worked really hard to make ourselves very visible. Yep. Very easy to find. Okay. So you know, Kristen has spent a lot of time on our website. We're very active on social media, both Instagram and Facebook. Uh, just posting on a daily basis, showing the cows who we are, what we're doing, getting our name within the local community. Okay. Uh, Kristen's done a lot of networking as far as meeting with other local farmers. Because the other thing too, in Virginia, there's there's not a lot of raw milk farmers per se. Okay. But we have a glut of chicken and beef producers. Correct. Um, so we've been able to make friends with a lot of the chicken and beef producers because they don't view us as another another marketing threat. Yes. And that has allowed us to network within the already established marketing channels within the state to kind of get our name out and also get recommendations and at some points access to you know, people's customers. Gotcha. Uh, to kind of like promote what we're doing and who we are. So just being very visible has been a big thing. And we also are very, very intentional to not be salesy. Okay. Like a lot of what we post, if you go on Facebook or Instagram and you simply look up um, at Creambrook Farm, yep. you'll find us very, very quickly. But you'll notice that we try to convey to people more of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Yes. We have gotten such strong response for that versus, you know, people are like, oh, we love your Instagram. We love your Facebook because it's, it's fun. It's enjoyable to look at. They're not constantly being sold. <laughs> yeah, they're not constantly being sold. And we do. We do, you know ask for things from time to time or you push sales, but we try to make sure that that is the minority of the time. Correct. And the majority of it is more just like allowing people to develop a relationship with us. Yeah, and experience the life you're yeah, living. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You Because know, people today, they want a relationship and they want a connection with whatever it is, whether it's their, their coffee barista or their bartender or their farmer 
or you know they're a person at the sports shop or whatever their their thing is per se. Yeah, yeah, we've gotten into a day and age where they just want everything individualized. Exactly. Kristen also has taken the uh, Charlotte Smith uh, marketing class. Okay. Yeah. Has been very very helpful. Very much worth the three hundred dollars. Um, when she came and asked me for three hundred bucks. For a marketing course, we did not have any money to spare at that point in time, and I really thought hard about it and tried to find a way to get around it. And she kept begging nicely, so we did it. And I, I don't, it's re- paid for I don't itself. regret it. Let's it's put paid it that for itself way. Many times yeah. over, I've yeah. wasted three hundred bucks on plenty of other things <laughs> uh, since we you know, bought the farm here. That yeah. was not one of them. That's been really helpful because Charlotte has a lot of interesting information about you know for those who don't know how to develop a website, yeah, how to do that. Um, how to reach people through email newsletters. We also have an email newsletter that we're very active with. And yep. we get typically like a 50% open rate on our oh, emails. Oh, wow. That's which really is, good. Yeah. Yeah, very high. Yeah. But once again, our emails tend to be more informational, not so much like salesy. So for example, Kristen's working on an email right now that's going to go out in the next couple of days related to Thanksgiving. Okay. And it's actually going to be about our family tradition of having duck for Thanksgiving versus turkey. Okay. And how to prepare a duck. We don't sell ducks. Yeah. Like, we're not in the duck business. But it just gives another way for people kind of like who are in the local foods who might be wanting to try something besides turkey. Yeah. You know, kind of like, oh, wow, yeah, here's here's another alternative way. And you know, we have other things like you know, how to make butter, how to make ghee, yeah. kefir, you know, just teaching people what they can do with their products. So you're also almost building more of a homesteady slash farm uh, life. Uh, that's what you're sharing there too. You're really more sharing the um, the whole farm lifestyle and not just, yeah. not, it's not just milk anymore. Yeah. I mean, people have this enamoration right now with you know, the country farm style life. Yes. And you know, uh, Instagram, social media hasn't helped that necessarily because it only shows – the most romantic, amazing photoshopped moments. Yeah, they don't um, see the mud. Doesn't show the mud, and we've we've conscientiously been trying to show a little more of the mud photos, which isn't hard this year. We got mm-hmm. plenty of it, but you know, just so people can also understand like the realities of yeah. the farm life too. But yeah, there's a strong call for that. You know, people want that connection to to their their food and all that, and that's something I tell people all the time. There's there's a lot of freaking out in the market right now about Whole Foods. And, you know, the uh, alternative food market being kind of, uh, what's the proper word for it? Commercialized. Commer- well, yeah, more centralized. The, like there's the butcher, fewer bigger yeah. players in it. And, you know, it's freaking our way out a little bit. And I, I kind of tell people all the time, like, look, you know, the one thing that Amazon is never ever going to be able to do is be their local farmer. Correct. They can't tell that story. They can't tell that story. So if you take that and you run with it, you will quickly develop a, a niche within your thing. The other thing too, I'll just say this on well, marketing before we go to the distribution is um, for our farm, I only need a thousand members. Okay. Now, now right now we're at 280. We yeah. might never make it to a thousand. It depends on how many cows we want to milk and what our financial needs are. But for point of discussion, let's say a thousand members. Correct. I only need a thousand members. Virginia has, I don't know how many million residents in it. There's quite a few at this point. So the thing is you can be freaking out about like, you know, how do I reach people? You know, trying to you know figure out how I'm gonna reach the masses. Where the, the honest truth is, like, you only need to find a thousand dedicated customers, make them your fans, spend time with them, meet with them, build that relationship. And you know, if you have a thousand people that that spend a thousand dollars a year with you, that's a million dollars. Absolutely. Now yeah. not, we probably won't get to a million, but you can do a lot. <laughs> Let's put it this yeah. way: with that much in sales, you know, and obviously there's a difference between gross and net. Yeah. Um, but because of that, we also have farm days. Uh, what's our term for open houses? Okay. In the spring and the fall, we we have it free for members. Try to get them out here so they can see the farm, meet us, pet baby calves, ride a hay whack ride, yeah, you know, all that the fun farming, agri touristy type stuff. Yeah. But we just are very intentional about developing that relationship. And you're doing what we can to make people feel like they're actually part of the farm, even if they might live, you know, 50, 60 miles away and in a townhouse. Correct. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, distribution quickly is we uh, we have multiple stores that surprisingly have been very willing to carry our milk. Okay. And when you're talking stories like health food stores or? Yeah, it could be health food stores. Okay. Uh, we have a, uh, a gym. Okay. We've got some actual like true store stores. Oh, uh, the smaller end, not yeah. like Kroger. Um, and what we have found to draw is is that you know stores right now are really competing for foot traffic. You know, Absolutely. cyberspace is hurting them pretty hard. So even though they can't charge for our product because raw milk can't be sold in Virginia through herd shares, 
Um, even though they can't charge for the product, uh, we don't actually get charged a shelf fee in any of our stores. In a few stores, we give you know, them free milk and stuff like that. But for them, the knowledge that, hey, we're going to get 30 to 40 people walking in here every week apparently carries some pretty major value okay. um, to them. So we've got multiple different stores throughout the area. We deliver to them every week. Each store has its own check sheet. So members check themselves off. So if there's like two mystery gallons in the back, you can look at the check sheet and figure out who it is instead of like, well, is that last week's or this week's or, you know. Yeah, yeah. And um, keeps it really simple, really organized. Kristen does all the billing online. Uh, so the stores don't handle any of that. And um, yeah, it's a pretty slick, slick system we got together so far. Okay, really cool. Now, real quick, how do you bill people? Is it through an online bill pay? Because they're, they're charged monthly for this, correct? Yes, well, every four weeks. Every four weeks, okay. Um, we are using bill.com. Okay. It's an online bill pay service. Yep. Um, we love it and we hate it. Okay. <laughs> if we found something better, we would switch. Right now, bill.com is working. I mean, the fees seem to be pretty much the same whether you're using bill.com, Square, Zero. Yeah, all about 3%. Yeah, they're all around 3%. We haven't quite figured out how to get around that. Um, we got a couple ideas on some different things we may look into moving forward. But for now, bill.com has worked. It gives us a way to, to keep track of customers' invoices, overdue invoices. I think it was built a little more to be B2B. Yes. Than it was to be, you know, necessarily managing several hundred customers. Yeah, several hundred, yeah. you know, individual clients. So yeah. it's worked for now. Let's put it that way. Yeah. 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 Um, talk to us a little bit about how you got this farm because this is a large farm. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I've, I've a lot of people, you, you're one that kind of has come on the scene and went big. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of that had to do with, you know, you did a lot of research before mm -hmm. you started this operation and you kind of really made sure the numbers worked. It's a long story, but kind of the, the main points along the way were about three years ago, Chris and I were extremely frustrated uh -huh. with our career. We had done what is kind of popularly what most of the main speakers push for young farmers. Yeah, we had done the apprenticeships and we had done the mid-level jobs and we had tried to rent land and, you know, all the low cost of entry, low risk methods. Yeah. And while we definitely had some success along the way, we weren't able to ever get any long-term traction. Um, leasing can be difficult yep. um, depending on who the landowner is and also depending on the person that's renting. We're very frustrated with the fact that we hadn't been able to like secure long-term farm land. And we started looking at some farms that were pretty nice to see what it would you know, cost for us to get going. And we quickly realized that um, the amount of money we were going to pay in renting, and especially if you're in dairy, you know, there's, there's pretty – infrastructure intensive so it's a little bit of a different scenario if we're talking about like beef or just yeah. turkeys or something like yeah, that that's yeah. on pasture but if you're in something a little more intensive like dairy we quickly realized the amount of money we were going to be paying on rent wasn't that far off of a mortgage okay in in a lower income area like okay yep new york wisconsin missouri you know where land prices are a little more reasonable whatever yeah. you define that as, as reasonable <laughs> so that kind of um sent us looking for farm property. So, yo, know, I was born in Maryland. Kristen was born in Richmond. We had gotten married. We had kind of farmed all over the place. We didn't have any like strong, this is home. So we're like, let's, let's spread the net wide. So um, I actually flipped to Wisconsin, looked at multiple farms up there. We identified one we really, really liked. Took Kristen up there. She liked it. Unfortunately, things didn't line up for us to purchase that farm. You know, we, we gave it a, another shot or the best shot we could. Following year, we went to Missouri looked at a bunch of farms in Missouri. And while there were some things we really liked about Missouri, there was also some pretty strong negatives. And, you know, that ended up us ruling Missouri out. The, the, the big thing with Missouri was like land's cheap. Yeah. But you also get what you buy. Absolutely. And There's not as many as customers. Yeah. We couldn't direct market out there. And also the, the infrastructure was crumbling as yeah. far as like support structures, you know, like supply companies, et cetera. And our goal at that point in time is to milk certify organic. So we're looking at a bigger property, bigger numbers. We weren't looking at direct marketing. At that point, Kristen and I had been involved in direct marketing. We had been at Polyface. We'd been the family uh -huh. cow. These are both multi-million dollar marketing companies. It's not that we hadn't seen it work, but we saw a tremendous amount of stress and pressure that comes with direct marketing. Gotcha. Uh -huh. And as a young family, um, that was not appealing to us. And I had seen multiple different farms that had made very successful lifestyles and incomes for themselves as commodity farmers. But they just had to run their businesses and their numbers completely different than everybody else. You're focusing on low cost infrastructure, uh, high high return on investment. You know more pasture based operations. So we thought, well, you know, hey, this 
I like farming. It's the whole reason I got into this. So yeah. why not figure out how to be the best farmers possible and make it work that way? So there was this farm that had actually been for sale for seven years. It was for sale while I was working for Polyface. I mean, I drove past it thousands of times probably. Um, never really paid that much attention to it because it was you know 243 acres. And when it was first listed, it was listed for like two and a quarter million. <laughs> okay. Wow. So yeah, this is oh, 2007 when the market, yeah, right before the market popped. I think this farm listed like a month or two before it, it burst. Wow. So I mean, you, you didn't even like think about it. Yeah. But at that point, I had worked for several multi multi million dollar businesses. Now I had seen farming work on a large a larger scale, and um, I was like, well, let's let's go at least look at this farm just to like have a reference for what it would be like if we moved back to the Shenandoah Valley because we always felt like this home connection yep. here to a degree. Mm -hmm. You know, we aren't from here originally. We're like, let's give it a try. So um, looked over the farm. It checked all the boxes I was looking for as far as it was very pastoral, had good supply networks around it, good farming community around it. It's a beautiful farm. It's a beautiful farm. It is too. I mean, yeah. looks was never super high on my priority list, but- It doesn't this, hurt. It doesn't hurt. This farm <laughs> yeah. does have some like very show farm-ish characteristics to it, you know, yeah. board fence, et cetera. So it's like, okay, well, if, if we're going to buy this, how, how do you swing at this point? It was now like $1.8 million. Yeah. Like how, how do we even- begin to wrap our mind around that. And my net worth, I'm, I'm not going to say it over here on, on the air, but it wasn't a whole lot. Uh, <laughs> so I had, um, while I was working at the Family Cal, I made a connection with Ted LeBeau with Kitchen Table Consultants. Yep. Um, if any of you are, are looking for financial information, I strongly recommend you look up Kitchen Table Consultants. He was consulting for the Family Cal. I got to know him. And I realized that like, the numbers end was kind of a weakness of mine. So when I left that job, I reached out to Ted and said, hey, um, Ted, is there any way you'd be interested in mentoring me? By the way, Ted charges like for solo jobs like three hundred dollars an hour. Yes. Like he's almost on par with a lawyer at this point. Yes, he's a very he's expensive, but very, he's well worth it. Extremely well worth it. But part. don't think that you can't go work with his company because he has some lower price people. Yes. <laughs> so, well, that's yeah. what I'm trying to say. If you work with him exclusively, like you're paying top dollar. But they've got a lot of really good team members who know the same information can really help out at you know much more affordable, affordable rates. Sorry, Ted, if you're listening. Anyway, um, you know, met, you know, basically reached out to Ted's like, hey, you know, would you be interested in mentoring me? And I, I was kind of like, there's no way he's going to go for this. And apparently I'd impressed him. And my time the family cat's like, dude, yeah, like, let's do it. Every week for 20 minutes, we'd have a phone call and we'd discuss things or he'd give me projects to work on. Mm -hmm. um, basically through Ted over the next two years, I got a master's. I got my MBA. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I probably can't compare to somebody who has a true blue MBA, but like it was that level of, you know, we're looking at spreadsheets, we're looking at learning how to build spreadsheets, something I had no idea how to do. Yeah, the cash flow. How, the, you know, yeah. building cash flow charts, um, looking at budgets, QuickBooks, you know, all that stuff. So Ted saw that like I was a pretty dedicated student. I was paying close attention. I was watching my money pretty closely. It always been thrifty, so that wasn't too difficult. And he said, well, there's this organization called Iroquois Valley Farms out of Chicago. They purchase land for people who are farming in organic methods. You might be a prime candidate for okay. you know, their their services. So Ted met a few people from Iroquois Valley, had some connections. So he made an introduction uh, for me to them. And I pitched him this grand plan for how we we're going to buy this $1.8 million farm and you know, certified organic and milk cows for organic valley and all that wonderful stuff to keep things within time constraints here long story short iroquois and valley and us went back and forth multiple different ideas and ways uh we eventually put a deal together with them also in conjunction with a local agricultural bank first bank of trust and also uh, fsa got involved too so between those three parties we were able to purchase the farm in the may of 2017 okay so moved here uh the grand plan obviously was the milk commercially Kristen, uh, his parents had milk cows for quite a while. They'd started their own creamery multiple years ago, and they had been wanting to scale their creamery up, but they couldn't do it between trying to milk cows and run the creamery. Uh, and there were some other things that changed them being able to milk their own cows. Correct. So we basically concocted a plan of moving their whole herd out here, uh, milking for them for the three-year transition, and then switching to organic once we hit the certification. That was the plan. That's we wrote up that way. It's how we sold it to everybody. It was a, it was a great plan, and it, it, yeah. sold, it sold well. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, good business plan is only good for as long as it's written on paper. Correct? Yeah, exactly. The business plans are usually only last as long as they, it takes the ink to dry. Anyway, once we purchased the farm and got in here, um, Kristen's parents' creamery had multiple problems. Uh, regulatory, employee. I mean, it was 
there's just a lot of issues that happened. And we quickly realized like, oh crud, we just bought this $1.8 million farm and we've got all the payments and everything else to go along with it. And our primary market is struggling badly. And yeah. this is no indictment on Kristen's parents. It, it's just a lot of lot of a lot of things happen. Yeah. yeah, it's a whole other podcast about what happened with their business. Uh, but anyway, th- they were bad bad timing for one thing. The dairy market was turning awful. Yeah, regulation was terrible. So anyway, we realized like, oh crud, um, we need to make changes quickly. So at that point, we started. We'd always plan to do some herd shares on the side while transitioning yep. organic, but now we're like, oh, we need to rely on this. So we started ramping up pretty heavily, and then uh, this past October their creamery officially did have to close for as a family member very happy it did you as a business person it's kind of a bummer but you know, fortunately in the year and a half it gave us enough runway that we were able to build our own market that we're at a point now where if organic valley came to me and offered a contract i'd probably say no thank you yeah um because we've, we've got it, it figured out and we see a very very bright future yeah You've um, built the tribe of loyal fans now. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not completely built, but it's on its way. Yeah. And we've got really great foundation and, and things are heading in the right direction. So you know, Iroquois Valley was really great to work with. You know, they realized we were having some struggles. So they they helped um, yeah. a couple different times with things. You know, um, First Bank was very understanding. I mean, it helps to a degree. Dairy's awful right now. Correct. Yeah. So the rule of thumb is like if everybody sucks and you suck less, yeah. <laughs> You're doing fine. Yes. So, yeah. you know, we were sucking less than most other dairy farmers, um, which is regrettable. It's awful. I kind of hate even using that, that example. But yeah, it played in our favor Yeah, that even though we were having some struggles, the investors and, and money people looking into things weren't like freaking out. Yeah. We, well, but they also knew that you had spreadsheets and budgets and all that to back it up. And you yeah. could show, you know, this is where we are. This is where we want to be. This is the things we're doing to get there. And you you, yeah. know, you laid out that success path for your business and you were chugging right along every single week. Yeah. Well, the first thing Ted and I did when we realized like, oh, crud, we're in trouble. Uh, well, Ted didn't, wasn't in trouble. I was in trouble. We started building a 13-week rolling cash flow budget. So okay. it was a live spreadsheet where you could put in your beginning balance yep. and we would see, you could project our sales and our costs, and you could see which way we were going. Okay. And that helped us make decisions because we quickly could see whether we were trending up or trending down. Yes. And if we were going either way, what adjustments had to be made. Correct. I don't really use that tool as much anymore now. Yeah. They're a little more established, but but during that really critical time, having the ability to, on a weekly basis, see which way we were heading really helped us with yeah. decision making. And once again, it really helps. And Kristen deserves a ton of credit for this. I know I haven't really spoke about her too much in this, but like she's really been the one that has headed up the marketing. Okay. She's extremely tight and thrifty like me too. You know, we kept the house cold and didn't go anywhere that first winter. And, you know, we we just kind of tightened the belts as hard as we could and just toughed it out. Yeah. And we're still not out of the woods yet, but things are way better this fall than they were last fall. Yeah. And we just had a big sit down meeting with our bankers, investors and all that. And we could show it on paper and they were, they were all very complimentary, Yeah, which makes you feel good. <laughs> yeah. 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 Speak to a little bit. Cause I know you talked about, you know, you were going to go wholesale. Um, mm-hmm. and now you look at the dairy market, how it is today. And I mean, conventional milk, what is it? $16 a hundred weight? 15, 16, 15. There. So that is, I mean, farmers are going out of business left and right and yeah. you guys are, are looking pretty good. Yeah, I mean we're not we're we're at a break even now, but we yeah. aren't we aren't like looking too good yet. You're not uh, you're not in the Bahamas yet. We're not yeah, well I don't know if I'll ever do that. But anyway, um yeah, for for us we saw with organic in two thousand fifteen, sixteen, we saw a market that was trending up. Yeah. We saw where at around forty to forty two, forty three dollars a hundred weight we could make very good profit. Correct. It wasn't going to be ridiculous, but we'd make a yeah. good profit enough to pay for the farm and have some money left over for infrastructure yeah. improvements and, you know, cost of living. But then that market has collapsed, not necessarily collapsed, but is- It's changed dramatically. It's changed dramatically. Yes, that's a good way to put it. So, and why do you think that is? You think the market could reach saturation and then people just started, people drinking less milk with new diets? I think with organic, for the most part, it's a transparency problem. Okay. Because, you know, with dairy specifically, you, yep. you can look at there's chicken and there's our parts of organic, but we'll, yep. we'll just look at dairy for a second. Um, People are very much willing to pay double market value if they know they're getting incredible double value back, which Correct. organic earlier on was able to make that sell, make that pitch, and people bought it without even thinking twice. However, as it's been undercover that there's these multi 
thousand cal capo ish organic dairies out west. I know there's one dairy in Texas that I think produces as much organic milk as all the small farms of Wisconsin combined. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the brand was tainted. Correct. Because there's you know you're telling your customers one thing, but in reality there's these operations that are not following the spirit or the law of organic. Yeah. And to the degree organic has only itself to blame for this. Yeah. It was growing super quick and yeah. they were desperate for milk. So they're letting pretty much anybody in and also making the USDA, the gatekeepers of organic rule keeping. Yeah. was a horrific mistake. Yeah. Cause we, I mean, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter which side of the political aisle you live on. The USDA has got a big for sale sign in front of it. And you know, if you got the money and you got the plans and you got the, you know, the lawyers, yeah. you can buy whatever you want. Well, just look at how they let hydroponic in. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's completely, it's it's complete disaster, and that's why you'll see some of these other new certifications popping up. Yeah, but I think we'll both agree that you know you don't have any certifications now. No, and it's all it basically it comes back to the story you're telling and being completely transparent with your customers, and that's right. how you're able to charge the premium you do. Uh, we are certifying the land organic. Okay, that was a prerequisite be, yeah. of working with Iroquois Valley. Oh, interesting. Did not know that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, they've got to sell to their investors. Like, yeah. You know, there's got to be some sort of standard for yeah. the investors to understand that. You know, because they're a big one of their big messages they push is you know, healing the soil and the land. Yeah. So, and you know, organic methods to a large degree head in that direction. Not all yeah. of them, but you know, most of them. Yeah. Do. So, and the good operators, organic operators, are usually you know doing more than restoring soil health. Yes. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But yes, as far as our marketing goes. We don't have any, you know, we're not certified humane or there's a certification for everything. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So let's talk a little, dive into that sustainable aspect. So what is sustainability, A, for the farm to you? Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, we talked about organic, but I don't think sustainable means organic necessarily. Right. There's no, a lot more to it. No, sustainable and organic aren't cousins, even though they, they try to get portrayed yeah. that way sometimes. And it there's a lot of variation with organic. So you got to be careful with degree. You know, there's the bad operations that obviously stick out with a sore thumb. And there's also some really, really good operations that are going well beyond the intent of organic. But yeah. the problem is when you get lumped in with a big tribe like that and you put yourself under a certification, you're now along with everybody else. And that's one of the reasons we don't have a certification is because I'm comfortable marketing who we are. And I'm not constantly worried about, well, there's that big organic dairy down the road that, yo, yeah, it's not do what we do, but I'm tied to them because we share the same label. Yeah. And so when a bad story comes out, they all sudden link you guys. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So as far as sustainability goes, you were harvesting grass. Yeah. So once we get our soul life going and we kind of get the farm up to full capacity and we have everything in place because we're still doing some infrastructure improvements as far yeah. as pastured water and fencing and all that stuff. And your soil's still healing. The soil's still healing. That's, the soil here is pretty good. Yeah. And the farmer before me had not really abused it too badly. So for a farm in this area, it was actually in pretty decent shape from a biological standpoint, which was another reason why I was very excited to get it. But once we have all those things going, we're going to be a very, very, very low input operation. Like besides buying mineral and maybe some hay every now and then and fuel and, you know, the normal things, electric things you normally have to get, that's going to be it. Yeah. I mean, when you look at my financials and you look at our, there's a category called cost of goods sold. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. cost directly tied to the production of products. And right, what kind of things go in that category? Uh, So that would be like uh, milk jugs. Yep. Labels. Yep. You know, seed. Uh, what's there? Yeah. Anything involving the direct production of that, yep. that good. Um, so, like, if I, if I put a roof on a building, that's not yeah. cost of goods sold. That's, that's just know, bottom line. That's infrastructure yeah. costs, yeah. Um, which would fall into depreciation. So, anyway, I'm not an accountant, and I'm not really that great with math. So, I would just encourage anybody who's listening to this that, like, with the proper teaching and with the proper discipline, you'll be surprised in what you can learn yep. about running your own budgeting and understanding your own stuff. And one of the things that really has helped me through our tough times is the fact that I can sit down with bankers or investors I can talk their talk and I can bury them in paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, you know, the fact that I can play their game has been a massive advantage that I have over most other farmers. Yeah. So if, if you're looking for a hobby this winter uh, and you like books or reading, play around with some spreadsheets and, you know, look up some courses on, on how to yeah. help with your farm finance. But anyway, as far as sustainability goes, you know, so once we get through that, that's going to really, you know, it's one of the reasons we could buy a farm as big is because so much of our income isn't tied up 
in just production costs. We have a lot of income that we can then in turn invest into real estate. Now, in all fairness, because we are 100% grass fed dairy, you probably could make an argument from a bookkeeping standpoint that the cost of our real estate should be factored into the cost of our production mm, because yeah. we are yeah. real estate bound in our production. You know, it takes roughly three to four acres of grass to feed a cow. Hundred percent grass fed year round. Dairy, dairy. Yes, yeah. so it's one of the reasons why we have two hundred forty three acres. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that plays into to all that too. But yeah, I mean we're, I'm very excited about it because we're going through the initial startup costs now. But once we have everything kind of up and running and the machine starts running, it almost becomes cyclical as far as yeah. it turns in on soft. And we've definitely kicked the idea around of you know going to glass packaging at some point too, which would kind of help on the the production packaging and make it even more. Aesthetically pleasing. Uh, well, not just that, but you know the amount of money we spend on jugs every year. Okay. Um, yeah. It, you know that cost would not disappear, but it would be reduced. Yeah. But the problem with glass is, you know, if we were to switch the glass, it'd be like a thirty to forty thousand dollar tool up. Okay. We don't have that right now. Yeah. So while we're building the market and other things, we're not stick with plastic. Yeah. Um, but that is. Our long-term goal is eventually have some sort of glass container. Gotcha. Yeah, if you're looking for a good book on uh, farm finance, I highly recommend the Fearless Farm Finances book. Um, it's a great one. Ben, do you have any other ones you've recommended or read? I learned on the run. Okay, from Ted. <laughs> yeah, from <laughs> he Ted. He said write a book. <laughs> if you get him to sit down that long, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, so as a farmer, there are endless tasks to be done. How do you make sure to focus and task and tackle the most important vital priorities? You have to be a piece of the fact that you're not going to get everything done. Okay. So Chris and I will sit down. Usually Monday, we sit down first thing after breakfast and just go over the week real quick. Yeah. Usually through a process of elimination, you pretty quickly realize what's not going to get done. Okay. So you have to pick what that's what that is. So. With farming, there is definitely a difference between what you think needs to be done and what should be getting done. Uh huh. So just having the wisdom to siphon everything along those lines is really, really critical. Okay. Because I know way too many farmers that, yo, know, come July or August, they're like, oh, man, we're a month behind. And it wasn't that they weren't working. They were. It's just they weren't working on the things they should have been working on. Correct. Because we all have things we love and things we hate. Yeah. And it's easy to work on the things we love. And it's also easy to work on the things that are urgent. Yes. Yo. Oh, man. It's April 10th and taxes are due. Maybe I should work on them. Yeah. Yeah, you should go work on your taxes, but that also should be done like February. Yes, that should have been prioritized <laughs> differently. Not yeah. like while you're trying to plant. Yeah. We have a firm rule here now that like any bookkeeping related thing has to absolutely be finished before May 1st. Okay. Because I can do maintenance on books through the summertime, but having the time to actually sit down and work on budgets and make cash flow sheets and do a lot of stuff during the summertime, it's a joke. Yeah. It's just not going to happen. So making sure that and it's really important to have those things. Correct. So make sure I have them in hand ready to go before May is really, really critical. Yeah. Same with like seed purchases. If you want to buy seed, like I'm already, if I'm not planning on planting anything this year, but in a year that I would, I would already have the varieties picked out now. Yeah. And if I had the money on order too, or at least you know, some sort of pay. pay reserve or something. Reserve or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Not March when, yeah. you know, everybody's scrambling at the last minute. And the other thing too is like, you know, I, I communicate with my suppliers on a regular basis. They know me really well. I've developed a relationship with them. So if I call them and say, hey, I need something. Yeah. Chances are I'm going to get it if there is a tight supply. Yeah. Because you have cultivated those relationships. We built the relationships with them. and Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned Ted as one of your mentors. Mm -hmm. You know, what other mentors would you say have influenced you and what are the kind of the main points that you have learned? Um, well, I mean, I started at Polyface. Yeah. So obviously Joel. I think Joel at this point is kind of more of a, even though we're eight to 10 minutes apart via, you know, the road, um, we don't see each other a whole lot. You know, he travels and does beef and chicken and I do dairy. So yeah, I'm, I'm not doing beef and chicken. They're not doing cows. So, or dairy. So yeah. I'll bump into every now and then, but I guess say more of a father figure. Like any kid looks at their parent, there's probably things that, yeah, I definitely look over there and I'm like, oh man, I want to do it that way. And I'm sure there's stuff they look over here and they're like, oh, I want to do it that way either. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of one of those fun things where it's. Yeah. Well, it takes all types to yeah. make it work. Yeah, yeah. No, it does take all types to make it work. So, but I mean, that's where I learned, you know, about efficiency and where to work. And, you know, I got my, my ground level start. A lot of my ideas on grass management and cows and all that started there. So, yeah, I'm incredibly grateful for them taking a risk on a pretty green 20 year old 
yeah 11 years ago and that was you know the start of it um so joel was a big one uh edwin shank the owner of the family cow has been very pivotal pivotal you know a lot of our stuff with raw milk as yeah. far as like cleanliness and bottling packaging et cetera, et cetera. yeah clifford hall baker with hamilton heights that was the other organic dairy we ran in pennsylvania cliff and i were actually too much alike for our own good okay. personality wise but he was the one who kind of took me and challenged me to go beyond my comfort zone Okay. And like, I'm already a very risky person as uh-huh. it was, is, but he was the one that really convinced me to, to jump the cliff. Um, so, yeah. you know, just go for it. So that was, to a degree, he maybe created a monster by doing that, but I've enjoyed it. Yeah, those are the major ones. Yeah. To the people, the new people coming up that just starting, you know, they're working through the fears and the worries, mm-hmm. the doubts and the struggles to start their farm. And even that haven't started, but are thinking of start starting, what would you say to them? Mm, that's a good question. Um, first, figure out if farming's for you. Okay. There's a lot of people who think farming is what they should be doing, but they've seen the romanticized Instagram posts. They've heard of the lifestyle, the country living, out of the city, the freedom. And while all those things are true, those are just a small fraction of what farming actually is or is like. Um, especially if you are are coming from a low cash perspective, which I was. I mean, I started at Polyface. I had a couple thousand bucks saved and that was it. Yeah. You know, apprenticeships and internships are great because it gives you a way to dip your toe in the ocean without getting in completely wet. But you eventually are going to have to dive in. I know so many people out there who are trying to farm or do stuff and they're, they're waiting for their ship to come in or for the stars to align or whatever metaphor you want to use. And that is... Very, very rarely happens. And when it does, it's usually because somebody's been working really hard for it for like 10 to 20 years. Yeah. And you just so happen to be there when their their boat came in. Like, oh, man, he's so lucky. You can make luck happen to a degree. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah, go out there, get experiences, try different things. I caught a lot of criticism the first couple of years I was farming from multiple different people because Ben never sticks with anything because I would do chickens and I would do turkeys and I tried pigs and then we messed up, you know, dairy and and we were raised ducks and freedom rangers and you know we would, did a lot of things for you know maybe a year or sometimes yeah the, the year and that was it and um looking back on it it was actually a really good thing because it gave me a chance to taste everything yeah and then when i found dairy and realized like wow this is what i'm actually really good at this yeah. fits my skill set really well um my personality my you know goals and ambitions that was off and running and I wasn't always I'm not distracted now by the like, oh, maybe you should try turkeys or maybe we should think about adding pigs. And the thing too is like diversity is very, very good. Yeah. Especially when you're first getting started, diversity is key. But the further you get down the road, you will eventually need to figure out what you're good at and specialize in that. I I see way too many farmers that are trying to do way too much. Absolutely. And basically what happens is they end up being, uh, they're not very good at anything. Yeah. And it shows in their product, it shows in their marketing, and then they're like, well, why does my stuff not sell? Why am I not having success? Well, that probably plays into it. So yeah. you know, here at Creambrook, we are a dairy farm and we sell raw, well, we don't sell raw milk. You can't sell <laughs> we it. We can't sell it. We are her share dairy. Yeah. We focus on having the absolute best tasting milk, period, with the best service. Yeah. And period. it shows because your customers buy and they stay. Yes. Yeah. We have very high retention rates and obviously we've, we've had pretty rapid growth. Because of those things. Yeah. I'm not out here trying to also wrestle pigs. Yeah. Chase beef cows and argue with processors or how I want meat cut up. I know what I'm doing. And to a degree, it was almost a blessing when Kristen's parents, Creamery, did finally leave the picture because it was, it was a, in some ways, a pretty major distraction for us. Yeah. Um, even though it was within dairy. Um, so being able to give that laser focus to like, okay, this is what we need to do and it's, we need to be world class at it. Yes. Not just middle of the pack. That changed things dramatically for us. So, you know, it's, it's a baby step. It's a process. I mean, I've been doing this for 11 years now. And, you know, I've, I've no fault to a lot of the people I farm with, but I've seen a lot of people come and go in that time period. And, you know, things happen. Sometimes people got to change careers or paths, and that's totally fine. But farming is business, and business can be brutal sometimes. And you just got to be willing to take your lumps and you have to build in resilience. Absolutely. And realize like farming is boxing. You're going to take a couple in the chin and the mouth in succession usually. Yeah. And you got to be willing to wait that round out and just be thankful when the bell rings and you get a quick break and then you're back at it. You know, you you have to just, I know without a doubt, 
I was created to be a farmer. Yeah. That's who I am. It's what I'm supposed to be. It doesn't mean I couldn't change careers or do something different down the road. But having that, every time the fire gets hot, it's not like, oh, did I make the wrong choice? Maybe I should have been a you know, mechanic or you know, electrician or something like that. Yeah. Uh, no. I'm doing supposed to, exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm just having to go through one of those tough periods that everybody has to go through. Yeah. And talk to other farmers. <laughs> Don't allow yourself to get in these little farm bubbles because that's where stupidity happens when you live in an echo chamber. Yeah. Because then you'll get, when you get outside, you realize like, oh, I'm not the only one dealing with this problem. Oh, I'm not the only one who just got sucker punched by the industry. I'm not the only one who had some great successes. Yeah. It's not all, I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer on it. Like there's really, really good things about farming too, but it's the, it's the mud in the dreary days and the bad customers and the cash flow problems. That's what takes out the vast majority of farmers. So if you understand your finances and you understand your marketing, you'll be fine. Like focus on those two things if you had to focus on anything. And make sure you have a viable business model. Yeah, and you'll, you'll figure that out through those two things. Yeah. Like production is not really that stinking hard. At, well, yeah, when we teach, we teach production just one of the five legs. Yeah. Yeah, those four other things you have to be good at in order to make your farm run. Yeah, but I mean pretty much anybody can milk a cow or grow lettuce or dig up potatoes. Exactly. If you think you need to be special to do that, you just don't know what you're talking about. Now, obviously, there's a difference between somebody who does really, really, really well and those who don't, but it's the person who can take that potato and knows how to sell it or knows how to get it into a wholesale market or maybe especially even with inside a wholesale market. Correct. That's you where know, the real I, money is. I yeah. know people who do, you know, you can make money doing commodities. Yes. And I feel like, the you yeah. know, commodity agriculture gets knocked a lot. We were going to give it a try and it didn't work out for us. Um, and we've changed gears. And I'm happy with where we're at. But like, I know people who are in commodity agriculture and they're doing pretty darn well. Yeah. They've had to learn their business. They had to understand what they were good at. They understood that they were not marketers. Yeah. They, they knew what their strengths and their weaknesses were. And they they tailored their farm and their business to their strengths and weaknesses. And, you know, it worked out. You know, having come from Polyface, I've seen so many people that are like, we're going to do the Joel Salatin model. And then they come back in a couple of years like, it doesn't work. Well, it's not that it didn't work. It's that it's Joel Salatin's model for Joel. Joel knows what Joel's good at. Yeah. He's also, I think, aware of what he's not good at, and he tailors his business accordingly. And you're Absolutely. not Joel. So if you yeah. go out there and you try to carbon copy his model, unless you're one of the very few rare people that share the same exact traits he does, you're going to fall flat on your face somewhere yeah. along the line. So you have to take your business and tailor it to, you know, I've, I've tailored my business to Ben Beichler and I understand yeah. what I'm good at, what my wife's good at. What yeah. we're not good at, and you know, we're having to sub that out. Yeah. yeah, and we've both seen farms that try to do the whole Joel thing, and then just again, as you said, flat fall flat in their face because they're not Joel. Exactly, and I'm not trying to say like Joel's some ultra human special person. He's just incredibly smart at what he's good at and knows how to to channel it. Yes, all of us have talents. Everybody has talents. We've all got weaknesses. So as you're going through the starting part of your career, it should also be a period of self discovery. Yes, absolutely. Of like, what are you good at? What are you not good at? And if you're not good at something, that's okay. Don't like beat yourself up over it. Like I am not a crack mechanic. Yeah. I maybe could be if I put the time in. I don't have the time to figure it out at this point. So I have to figure out how to shoestring things or bring in people who are smarter than me to work on it. We're going to get part of the house roof redone here next couple of weeks. I mean, I could go on YouTube and figure out how to put asphalt shingles down, all that stuff. Yeah. Reality is I don't have the time right now. And quite frankly, for the amount of money I would save, it's just better have somebody else do it. Correct. Yeah. So you sometimes you get in these homestead circles and they're like, you got to do it yourself or you're a failure. Sometimes failing is being a success. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of success was born out of just failing time and time again. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. the thing. You know, if you look at like, if you look at sports teams or you look at very, very high performing athletes, like I just saw this thing recently here on, um, I think his name's Alex Hanold. He's yep. the, the free solo climber who just climbed that yep. like 3,000 foot granite. Yes, I forget the name of it, Yosemite. but yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it, I, I almost lost my lunch watching his video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I don't like heights. So, But the thing is like what I didn't realize is he spent two years climbing that thing with ropes. Yeah. Trying to figure out where the failure points were. Mm -hmm. Like he went up on a rope intentionally looking to fail because it's a lot better to fail with, with a rope. rope than when you're at 2,800 feet and you got nothing but granite to welcome you if you fall off. Yeah. And if you look at the same thing like Navy SEALs, you know, a lot of these very, very high performing individuals or organizations like the SEALs, for example, we look at them as demigods 
they're not. What separates them from us is that they are on the active search for failure and they push to the point of failure all the time in training so that when they're actually in the diamond or on the cliff or on the mission that they've severely mitigated all the risks because they've done this a thousand times. Yeah. They know what they're doing. And if something goes wrong, they know what plan B, C, and D is. Yeah. And farmers to a degree are infamous for just kind of sticking to the finger to the wind and that's the determining factor on which way they're taking their business. Yeah. What crops they're going to grow, where, where they're going to market. Yeah, exactly. But the fact of the matter is if you're looking at your farm, your career, your business, like looking for the failure points and then correcting them from there. Yeah. And I'm not saying like you need to have a path and direction you're going on. The best thing ever happened for Kristen and I was we, we made the decision that we were going to buy a farm. Yeah. And then after that, every decision got ran through this filter of does this help push us towards us that towards that goal or not? But the point is, while you're on that path, on that journey, pushing those goals, you also got to be looking at like, where's where's the weak points? Where's my weak points? Yo, how can we mitigate that? Yeah. And to your success and failure, I was just at a conference and they were talking about um, tennis. One thing I did not know that 70% of the points are made on failure. 30% are made on the offense. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at uh, baseball, you mm -hmm. know, the best hitters <laughs> are, you know, in the, in the 300s, which means they're missing two for every one they hit. Yeah. So, you Actually know, I, a little, little more into, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's one of those things I think we have to realize. And then I think it also comes back to the 10,000 hours mm -hmm. that you really have to put in that 10,000 hours before you were an expert. And I, I read that, you know, when we had been farming for eight or 10 years and I started doing the math calculations and I realized, yes, I have been farming now for about 10,000 hours. <laughs> and then at that point, it just, it started to flow. It got easy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the whole, I started getting bored actually, mm -hmm. um, because it just, you know, stuff worked. Yeah. Yeah. You, you get inertia behind you too. And Absolutely. That, that, that flywheel. Helps. Yeah. That huge flywheel going. Yeah. You, you get experience inertia, you get capital inertia, you get a team built, a team built marketing inertia. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing too, is like, go, go find mentors. Like you'd be surprised people that you would think are completely unreachable because they're just out of your league. Mm-hmm. If you go to them with an attitude of humility and also a desire to learn and do absolutely anything, you'd be surprised how much those people are willing to help for little or nothing. Yeah. Like my relationship with Ted. That's I mean, been how a game much, changer for us. If you were to pay for those hours, how much would that have cost? Uh, I'm afraid to say at this point, but yeah, uh, it's been thousands and thousands of dollars. Yeah. So the thing is like you can pay that, you can pay thousands of thousands of dollars in mistakes, getting the experience and learning it on your own. Or you could just take a humility pill, go to people, be like, hey, you know, how does this work? How's it, how's it really work? Yeah. Versus how you think it works. Because there's usually a big disconnect with starting farmers between how they think it works and how it actually works. Well, I think, you know, one of the questions I saw in one of the groups online, they said, you know, does these, uh, these you know, rock star farmers have perfect farms with no weeds. And I was very quick to say, you know, they started from nothing. Mm -hmm. They had weeds. Now they have a point where, A, they can hire people to take care of the weeds. B, yeah. they know how to manage weeds. But C, it's strategic camera placement. <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, you do only see the Instagram side of farming mate, a lot of times too. Yeah, so it's, it's important to get out and actually get your fingernails dirty, step in the mud, you know, yeah. smell the poop, and realize, you know, what actually goes on into these operations because I've seen plenty of uh, well-to-do fellows who were a complete success in their first industry and they thought since they were such hot stuff that that would translate to farming. Only problem is, you know, farming's biology and factories pretty much, you know, spreadsheets and managing other things um, and, you know, biology uh, kicks your butt on a regular basis. And, the know, weather, yeah. And, yeah, I watched quite a few egos get uh, chipped away at. By, yeah. By farming. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's not an easy profession, but it's one of the most rewarding. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm very thankful every day that I get to do this. Yeah. You know, there's definitely days where you're like, uh, but overall, you know, yeah. very thankful. If you could pick one, what would be your favorite farming tool and how has it changed your farm? Um, I love tractors. <laughs> <laughs> That's a childhood thing that kind of got me in the farming. Um, with our farm, probably the single most efficient tool for us is actually a four-wheeler. Okay. Because, you know, we cover a lot of ground. Yeah. We could have cows on multiple ends of the farm. Moving cows from one end of the farm to the next. Um, you know, with a dairy, you would say you would think a milking machine. Well, that's also very critical. But for us, the four-wheeler is a major 
time saving tool. Yeah. Plus it gives us a, a way to just make things happen very quickly if we need to. Yeah. And you kind of, uh, uh, you've got some elevation and all that. Yeah. This is not a flat yeah. farm. I mean, you know, we've got a fair amount of roll and pitch and rocks and, um, you know, it's, it's not easy to get around some parts of the farm and you know, with a four wheeler, it's very, very easy yeah, and efficient. And, um, it probably gets ran more than you might, you know, if you look at the hours we put on the four wheeler versus what we do on, on tractors and other equipment, it's probably double I would, wow. or more, I would yeah. imagine. Cool. So do you believe that now is the best time to get into farming? And if so, why or why not? I mean, the question kind of infers that there is not a good time to get into farming. Okay. And I think whether it's good or not good times kind of not, we shouldn't let that dictate what we do. Okay. okay like right now, dairy sucks. I mean, it's just bad. This is not in the conventional sense, a good time to be trying to do anything with milk cows. Yet we're building a priest, you know, nice little business model within it. But we also had to search through the disaster of an industry right now to try to figure out where the place was and what worked for us and yeah. what we knew we could be good at. If you're a fair weather farmer, meaning you only get in when it looks good, you'll be getting in with everybody else. And as soon as things turn bad, you know, you'll be getting out with everybody else. So you have to have a mentality of, you know, you got to have a long term plan. Yeah. You got to know what you're doing, what you're doing. You need to know what you're calling within the businesses. Okay. You know, you just have to be really, really disciplined. Yeah. Because, you know, There'll be a day here in another couple of years, probably when dairy's looking pretty good again. And, you know, we'll look like freaking geniuses because we got in when it was bad. And yeah. you know, now we have all this equity and stuff built up within it. In all fairness, at this point in time, it, it looks like, you know, a questionable decision. And But we also have to be realistic about the fact that, you know, um, the legality of raw milk can change. Yeah. Dairy might not be our long-term future. So we also have to, like, we're totally committed to dairy, but we also have to be realistic about the fact that we don't control the market entirely or regulation and things could change and we need to at least have a little bit of a backup plan. Not not so much of a backup plan that it's distracting us from doing what we should be doing right now, but at least an awareness of like, okay, if something really bad happens, this is what our next step would be. If you want to put it that way. So gotcha. if you feel like you should be farming, you need to be farming. Like if you got the dream, go do it. Don't keep waiting for the right moment, the right job, the right person. Yeah, if if you if you do, you'll all of a sudden be sixty and never done it. Correct. So, and I've worked with those. Yeah. So it's like you gotta you only live once. The most successful people have also had some of the biggest failures in life too. Absolutely. And those who learn how to embrace the word no and to accept defeat with a smile, those are usually the most successful people. So Absolutely. I mean I've taken quite a few on the chin throughout the years. And I'm sure I'll take a few more here in the next couple of years too. It's just it's part of the game. Yeah. And you gotta love it. Yeah, I think just be bold and go for it. I mean, what's to lose? Yeah, that's pretty much what you did. <laughs> well, yeah, no, we, we, we burnt the bridge and went all in. So, um, yeah. I mean, I don't advise jumping in, you know, at one point, a million dollar purchase. A couple yeah. years in, like it, we were, I was almost 10 years in at that point and yeah. had multiple very smarter than me people looking over my shoulder, you know, giving us advice and counsel what to do. So build a support network. Absolutely. Be invaluable when you need them. Yeah. Well, Ben, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Yeah, you're welcome. It's fun. So there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.